to start recording. Hi, everyone, and welcome. A congratulations out to the year two policy fellows who today are doing their teach back. So they are telling us exactly what they did on their practicum. And they are also graduating. This is the last formal requirement to be a graduate of the PWN Policy Fellowship. Everyone can officially change their email signatures to say that they are PWN Policy Fellows. Congratulations to everyone who's online. I am going to share my screen. Congratulations. All right, everyone. It is time to meet our graduates. First off, we have Jesse Mona and Nishi Parkinson, LaDawn Tate, Marnina Miller. Meta Smith Davis, Olga Irwin, Roxy Shelia, Tana. Congratulations so much to everyone out there. And now what we're going to do is go through, everyone has signed up for a specific time, and we're gonna go through our policy practicum teach back. So first up, we have Tana. Tana, are you still on? Oops. Okay, I'm thinking that Tana might not be on right now. So when Tana's able to jump back on, she can go. But for now, we will start with Jesse Mona. Are you on? I see you. Can you unmute yourself? Jesse Mona, try talking now. I unmuted you. Okay, LaDawn, you are up. I will stop sharing my screen and you can share yours. Okay, hi. Hi. <laughs> I should say that I've given everyone a strict 10 minute time frame. So if I, if I cut folks off, that's why. But LaDawn, uh -oh. you are up. Okay, okay. Well, I'll try to, I'll make this quick. <laughs> so my practice is introducing the Detroit EMA Project LEAP, a learning empowerment advocacy participation program. Project LEAP, which is the learning empower advocacy program is a comprehensive advocacy training program in the nation for people living with and affected by HIV, which was inspired by Houston. That's where we got the idea from. So, uh, your hand raised. Sheila. <laughs> I said it was inspired by Houston. We got the idea. We actually sent two people down there to Houston to check out the Project Leap down there. And we had to, when they brought it back, we decided to put a Detroit stand on it because Detroit has some of the similar issues, but other issues to work with. So we came up to where um, we did a trial of it last year, and we realized some things that needed to be discussed and some things that needed to be teached. So this is what we came up with. We decided to make LEAP a 10-week program. Um, we would do it once a week on Thursdays from 9 to 2. And I am a part of a SEMHAC, which is Southeastern Michigan HIV AIDS Council. We're going to actually have the graduation during a full council meeting. 
So during the prior time of the 10 weeks, we expect for our LEAP students to get familiar with the SIMHAC Council because that's kind of part of the reason for them to be more involved with their care and the quality and understand funding and everything. So we expect for them to attend a full council meeting, participate in the HIV testing event so they can become familiar with it, um, be a part of the finance committee and the PSRA. PSRA is where we allocate fundings that we're gonna use as far as Ryan White fundings. We allocate it to different areas that is needed as far as the EMA of Detroit. We came up with our student guidelines. You know, we would like to have at least, I'm not gonna read everything, I'm just gonna briefly go through it. But we came up with um, our student guidelines. We was hoping to at least have seven HIV positive people and five people that are maybe affected by it. Not living with it, you know, but just maybe affected by it. They may know about it or something like that. We're also hoping we can get some youth involved because we're trying to actually start a youth SEMHAC council. So we're trying to get some youth involved so that they can be more on top and up to speed and also into their care. And we're trying to get transgenders involved. We're having a hard time getting transgenders involved. So those, the youth and the transgenders is one of our main focus. Um, all we ask is that they be available. They understand the times and the days and we want them to be available, complete their homework, um, understand the roles of the LEAP far as the prevention and care and services. We also want them to demonstrate an interest in volunteering, advocacy, other types of community involvement, if possible, have a past history in those items. Um, and interpret skills far as that can help them along in the workforce. Like um, some of the pilot people we used from last year, they actually was able to use that to like get jobs working in the HIV field or either higher, you know, in the state level. So that was great. This is our, what we're going to do for the set for the 10 weeks. Okay. So culture competency. We chose this one here to be our number one training far as, because in the morning time, we're going to introduce and explain what everything is about, but we chose cultural competency because we understand that everyone is not aware as far as if we do have transgenders, we need them to be safe. We want everybody to have a safe space. So far as the cultural competency, it's like gender specific because you got some heterosexuals that don't understand the LGBT community at all. So we need for them to actually be able to understand that we want everyone to be in a safe space. So we chose cultural competency to be the number one thing. So that way everyone, you can get all the questions you need, everything you need to know about cultural competency in that one day. Um, the Ryan White overview, so they can understand the Ryan White, the HIV care continuum, you know, the new 2020, um, and the overview of how the care funds actually work. We also did an activity to where we can get the allies and the people that are living with HIV more involved and like on the same page and level. Two, <laughs> um, so look, I'm sorry, I'm moving too fast. So as you all see, we'll be doing an advocacy one-on-one. -on -one. I'll be teaching that! <laughs> using the PWN that I was taught from you all, so I'll be using that to teach others. <sighs> okay, moving along, let me see. Um, we also are gonna, in another week, we're gonna talk about barriers and reaching and, you know, barriers people have for us HIV, linking them into care. And on that same week, we're gonna talk about the intimate partner violence of HIV. A lot of people deals with HIV and violence, and that's something that needs to be brought up on as far as here so they can know how to handle that and how to deal with that. We're also going to do a teach back using the gang Kahoot. I'm not for sure if everyone's familiar with that to see what all everyone learned within the first couple of weeks. Um, we're also, we're involving Block. So Block is actually going to do some training sessions on stigma, intersectional oppression, and growth mindset. Um, we're also going to teach on disclosure. Um, oh, and also y'all see, I'll be teaching the intimate partner violence and HIV. Yes. <laughs> so a lot of these, um, I kind of learned, some of the stuff that I'm teaching is what I learned from the PWN. So by me 
learning it, they thought, thought that I would be good enough to teach it. So thank you, PWN, for that. <laughs> um, Ryan White standards. We need for the community to understand Ryan White standards and care. So we want everyone to understand that, not just only just for Ryan White, but for your own care in general. But, you know, it's man, he focused on HIV, so that's what we're teaching. Housing opportunity. We deal with a lot of homeless in Detroit, unfortunately. We have a lot of homeless people. So, you know, we're bringing them in to explain how can a person living with HIV actually get on the hopper list? And, you know, what's the process? What's the hold up? Our own little way of attack, you know, interrogating them. <laughs> and a low key tip. <laughs> Evaluations every day, community needs assessments. Now, um, we're going to actually, because we're trying to get more needs assessments done, especially for the youth and the transgender. So we're teaching people how to do a needs assessment so we can also utilize them to help us get to the youth and the transgenders. Um, and the following weeks, in our last following weeks, we'll be learning about the epidemic of you know, the overview about HIV, the surveillance process so they can understand how that works because we have a program here called Link Up Detroit. So that'll kind of explain how we get those people back into care and all of that. Um, what's the next plan? So we're gonna talk about the 2020 plan. The 2020 plan is, you know, ending the HIV ec epidemic. I'm sorry, excuse me for my words, y'all. Epidemic. Um, we're going to talk about the 2020 plan and how they can help with that. Um, the CIMAC roles and responsibilities. What does it mean to be a council member and a body member and be on the standing committee? Um, we're also going to teach robber rules of order because on SimHack that's very important to understand robber's rule of order, to know how to be able to run the meeting and conduct a meeting. This is what we've came up with so far, but we are still meeting in the process of this. Um, we actually are thinking about adding more weeks on to probably make it a 12 week, but for right now, this is what we have came up with as the committee. Right. Um, SimHack has really helped a great deal, you know, taking on this project and everything. So this is great. But what well, we are talking about it because I mentioned that, you know, we also need people to understand policy, you know, because a lot of questions have came up about letters, being able to write letters and um, about some of the things that Trump is doing. So people have asked questions about that. So we actually was going to maybe think about adding another week in here where we could teach about as far as policy bills, knowing where, who is the right person to write when it's, when you see something is going on that's right, learning how to contact your Congress people. So we actually are thinking about adding that in there. We just have not met yet to discuss the final touches about that. Great. But I know I was quick, quicker than 10 minutes, but that's our browse through. And you know, if you want more information about the core horse, and what it is that we came up with, you can always go to the www.simpac.org website to um, figure out what is our whole core horse that we're going to do and more. Thank you so much, LaDawn. Great job. Great job. I love Yay! how Yay, LaDawn! <laughs> your practicum was. You really worked with a whole bunch of people in developing this curriculum. Yes, um, we did. It, 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 yes. <laughs> It's not as easy as me just explaining it. It really does take work because you got to understand the what it is that you actually want to teach and what's the point of it, what you expect for the person to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot of planning. We actually, I do have a planning slide, but that's actually in the practicum where I show where we had the board of what we're going to do in the stickies, but that was in the practicum. So I hope I did good. Thank you all. And Great job. <laughs> Great job. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing your screen so I can start sharing mine. And I'm actually, I see that Tana's okay. back online. So I am going to ask Tana to talk us through her practicum. Hi ladies. I will be. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be talking about reproductive health, 
justice and abortion. And I hope y'all really enjoy it. Next slide. Uh, reproductive health means that. Did the slide go away? Someone just called yeah. me, I apologize. That's okay. Anyway. Now remember, you only have 10 minutes, so you might not be able to run through the whole thing. Um, oh, so I'm, maybe, not gonna, I'm not maybe, gonna talk about the whole slides. Oh, I'm gonna perfect. break it down. Uh, reproductive health means for women, safe sex, I lost it again. Uh, safe sex, uh, the capacity to decide whether or not we want kids or we don't want kids. But what birth control, what uh, care services, all of this is reproductive health. It's a human right for us women. Next slide. Think about it, inequalities to reproductive health. There's poverty, there's poor education, there's language barriers, barriers, limited jobs, fear of deportation. And most of this is done to the low income people. This is, I mean, this is what knowledge is about. Next slide. Um, the World uh, Health Organization accessed that 20% women of color will die, 14% uh, of men will die from unhealthy outcomes. Uh, the United Nations, uh, our unmet needs as far as sexual reproductive health deprives us of making good choices for ourselves. Women bear the worst barriers when it comes to reproductive health. Denial of these rights worsens our uh, poverty level. Next slide. Reproductive justice is the physical, spiritual, political, economic, and the well-being of women of color. These are things that our community needs. Next slide. Reproductive justice means uh, the decision about our own bodies, uh, health care, housing, mental health, substance abuse, all of this comes with reproductive justice. It is what we demand. If these needs aren't met, this is inhuman to our survival. Uh, Loretta Scott, Loretta Ross, uh, she defines it perfectly in intersectionality. It's race, it's gender, it's class, it's ability, to know uh, its sexual intersection. All of this comes with reproductive justice. It's a gender lens. Think about it. When you uh, throw out some ideas, I mean, y'all can say abortion, contraceptive, uh, immigration, disability, sexual orientation, economic justice, this all hits communities of color. Next slide. Uh, exactly, like the International Conference of Women of Africa. They thought that this was um, not their, <clears throat> they thought that the way everything the Global South thought that uh, we should be did not work for women of color. And it don't work for women of color. Uh, white women have a better chance at getting the things that they need, but women of color have difficulties of achieving good health, uh, whether or not we can take care of our kids, whether or not we wanna have kids. Next slide. So my thoughts on the framework is social, political, economic. Um, there is no single issue because we don't live single issue lives by Audrey Ladon. Next slide. So uh, I go into abortion, the turnaround study. The turnaround study examines women's mental health, physical health, and social economics. And um, compared to Karen, a baby full term. Next slide, please. 
It's the physical, mental employment, the education, the relationship status, the contraceptive. I mean, you think about it. This study went on for five years. And uh, women that, next slide, women that thought that this was the best thing for them, they were absolutely right. Because after five years, these women said that was the best thing for them was to have an abortion. Then you go into um, the gag rule. Um, the gag rule is undercut access to safe legal abortion by banning women's access to safe legal abortion, threatens patients' lives by restricting access or prevention. Uh, if women lose this access, where will they go? They won't know where to go. With the Trump administration uh, putting out uh, this new ruling that uh, not to plan parent plan parenthood is devastating to low income areas. It is very devastating. It is it's an attempt to keep us where we are without access to health care. Next slide. Um, you know, I have an action alert. I have been working on, we as down here in Texas have been working on uh, 86 legislation. And one of my top bills that I've been watching is uh, HB 1500 and uh, stop the ban of HB 1929 and SB 389. Ladies, I took a training this weekend at Planned Parenthood to get ready for this. We're gonna march on Austin's Capitol on this Thursday coming up. I am gonna turn the Capitol pink <laughs> along with some of the ladies in Texas. That's the end of it, y'all. Thank you. Great job, Tana. So Tana did this amazing uh, PowerPoint presentation so she can teach us all about the ways that like access to abortion is a reproductive justice issue um, and it needs to go beyond just like the limited understanding of reproductive rights into a more fulsome understanding of reproductive justice. Excellent. And also in order to understand reproductive justice, you have to learn about reproductive health. It is important because without reproductive health, you can't move to reproductive justice. Then you can't understand what the laws are on abortion if you don't do those two steps first. Y'all, it was a lot of work, but it was well worth it. I learned a lot. Great job, Tana. <laughs> Um, can you all see the full screen or is it blacked out part for you? It's blacked out, it's blacked out parts, but that's okay. I did my best and I have my reference pages, y'all. I'm not sure why that's happening. Is it better if it's like this for you? Yeah, that's good, but. Okay, I'll leave it like this then. Yeah. To make sure it's as, as open as possible so that you can see. Okay, so next up, um, we have, Jesse Moon, are you in a place where you can talk? Might still not be. Okay, um, so we'll try and get back to Jesse Mona a little later when she can actually speak. And so next up we she's have- She's here, Kelly, she's oh, here. She's here, yeah. oh, okay, jump in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, wait. Oh, shit. Someone has to take off one of their... Okay, go ahead, Mom. You can, she can see you on mine. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me? See you and hear you. Can't wait. Okay, thank you. So I want to thank you guys for coming to my graduation today. It really means a lot. And I am going to be presenting on the six protected classes of medication and it's dealing with Medicare Advantage and Medicare Part D. So um, I was very interested in this because I am a recipient of Medicare Part D. 
So I did a policy brief, which is gathering information on a particular subject so that the reader can get a better understanding and be more informed about making decisions for government policy. And um, I am actually still advocating in opposition at the federal and state level uh, for this uh, six protected classes of medication. There was a bill that we have going on right now here in Texas. There was um, actually no opposition to the antiretroviral, uh, one of the six medications. So for the state of Texas, it looks like the antiretrovirals will still remain a protected class. My first intentions for my policy practicum, my practicum project, was to do a work group. I like groups, but the work group didn't work. And I think the reason that it didn't work, it was challenging. And I believe one of the main reasons that it didn't work was because of stigma. When I sent some of the participants to the Age United website, you know, on the Age United website, of course, there's a lot of things about AIDS and HIV. And I think that that was one of the barriers that prevented people from wanting to get involved. The lessons that I learned from this though, is that I need to look outside my comfort zone uh, for participants instead of working with people that are associates, acquaintances, friends, or family, because that definitely did not work. Uh, my successes is that um, I was able to work with my host agency, NMAC, uh, my coach, Sable Nelson, uh, who was very knowledgeable actually on this subject. And um, I was a strong voice at the uh, table with Age United in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple months ago. And I actually sat at the table with um, the guy that does the policy reform, uh, senior vice. And I also sat at the table with the admiral, who is the admiral for Health and Human Services for the United States with the Trump administration. And I also got to meet uh, Health and Human Service Secretary, uh, Mr. Azar, and we all took a picture with him. Next slide. Uh, now, this is what piqued my, my interest in looking at these six protected classes of medication, was these four words that I saw, reignite the HIV epidemic. That was startling for me, because normally what we see is ending the HIV epidemic, not reigniting it. And so I wanted to know what impact this would have on my health. Uh, my restriction to life-saving medications would be an issue uh, and my longevity. So it was very important for me to get in there and find out what were these six protected classes dealing with Medicare Advantage and Part D. Next slide. So these are the six protected classes of medication. And as you see, I have the antiretroviral in red. That is the one that is the most important to me because I am taking this medication. Uh, also, we have the immunosuppressant, which deals with um, organ transplants to keep the body from rejecting the organ transplants. And then we have the antidepressant, uh, which is for people who are depressed, which uh, I qualify for that. We also have the um, neo, anti-neoplastics. Now, those are for people that uh, take certain types of medicine for cancer, and I am a cancer survivor. And we have the anti-psychotic medication for people who have psychotic episodes. And then we have the anti-convulsion uh, medication for people that have uh, epilepsy. Now, what's going on, in case you guys aren't aware of this, is that there is a proposed rule by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare and the Trump administration. They're going to propose to uh, remove the restrictions on these six protected classes and declassify. And when that happens, we are going to be subjected to step therapy, meaning that when your doctor says you take medication A, Insurance company says no. 
we want you to take medication B because it's cheaper. And this is all in the frame of saving money, which is a guise, you know, you can't believe this administration. So once your body starts indicating through your lab that this B medication is not working, it's called step therapy. And then hopefully you will be able to get back on the medication that your medical uh, informed provider, your professional is saying that you need to take. And this is something that everyone needs to really pay attention to these six protected classes of medication and what Medicare and Medicaid are doing as well as the Trump, Medicaid, uh, the Trump administration because if they do it with these six protected classes right now that are dealing with Medicare Advantage and Part D, what will it be next? Next slide. The journey continues in the policy world. As long as there are policies, we're always going to have work to do, ladies. We are always going to be creating policies as well as changing policies. My takeaway from this uh, practicum project was that I now, I have the strongest uh, courage and confidence to participate effectively at the local, state, and federal levels of government policy. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. And um, the policy fellowship has given me the courage to use my voice and speak up to the injustice in the world not limited to my community, but in the world. And so that's very, very important. Those educational webinars and presentations that we were um, privy to as being a policy fellow were very informative. And the good thing about them is they're just a click away and I can always go back to those webinars and presentations as a refresher in my mind. Creating and changing policy, you know, as late as yesterday, I was on the uh, INMAC website and uh, I saw that word infected just one time too many. And so I did uh, a little background digging. Uh, even though my coach is a part of that organization, uh, I did not, I wanted to go as high as I could go. And I did send it um, to the upper level of management at INMAC and I explained to them that these these words, infection, infected, infecting, uh, positive, and HIV people is very stigmatizing, which promotes the um, epidemic to continue. It's, it promotes shame, it promotes guilt, it promotes isolation, it doesn't do anything positive. And so every time I see that word infected and I think of an infection, well, I've had a few, you know, when I skinned my knees and I was a little girl, I remember them being brown and yellow and uh, green. Just a moment, one minute warning. They didn't look like me. And so um, creating and changing policy is going to be very important for us to continue uh, to stay involved in. And I have been invited to attend the annual AIDS clinical trials group network marketing in Arlington, uh, Virginia uh, in the next couple of months. And I'm also a part of the PWN USA Texas chapter rapid response task force. And what we are doing is actively monitoring house and Senate bills at the state level. Next slide. So working on this practicum policy fellowship for PWN this past year, it's been truly rewarding. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been a part of it. And I'm very, very proud of my uh, accomplishment in becoming a PWN USA Policy Fellow. And I want to send a special shout out to Kelly, who brought us to the finish line. Thank you so much, Kelly. And I want you guys to know that this is only the beginning. It's not the end. So thank you. Woo! Woo! Jesse Mona! Congratulations. That's great. Oh, Jesse. That's great. I love it feels like there was like four practicums built into that one practicum project. It's amazing how much you did. Thank you. That one. All right. So next up for us, we have Miss Roxy. Let me pull up. 
So Roxy did a fact sheet on SNAP work requirements. And this is what it looks like. I'm going to send it over to Roxy to explain what's going on. Hello, everybody. Well, I did my practicum on what is a supplemental nutrition assistance program and work requirements. SNAP, formerly known as Food Stamps, is the nation's most important anti-hunger funding program reaching 42 million people nationwide in 2017. Um, in the fiscal year 2017, the SNAP program reached 3,921,000 Texas residents, or 14% of the state population. In the state of Texas, more than 79% of SNAP participants are families with children, 28% are elderly or disabled, 48% are working families. Nationally, 68% are families with children, 33% are elderly or disabled, and 44% are in from working families. The average SNAP benefit in 2017 for each household member was $125 or $1.35 per meal. Currently, there are 22 states, including DC and Guam, that have a federal regulatory minimum for work requirements. Under the current federal law, it requires that adults ages 18 to 59 receiving SNAP benefits work part-time or agree to accept a job if offered. There are stricter requirements for able-bodied people with no children ages 18 to 49. They are subjected to work three months uh, limit of benefits in three years unless they meet the work requirements of working 80 hours per month. Failure to meet these requirements result in disqualification of SNAP benefits for one month for the first occurrence, three months for the second, and six months for the third. Six states disqualify the entire family if the head of household fails to comply. Um, Mississippi has extended disqualification period and they disqualify the entire family and permanently disqualify the recipient after the third non-compliance. Here in Texas, we do not have uh, mandatory work requirements. What Texas does have is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Employment and Training to promote long-term self-sufficiency and independence by preparing SNAP recipients for employment through work-related education and training activities. The goal of SNAP ENT is to assess, uh, I'm sorry, assist SNAP recipients in obtaining employment, including provision of work opportunities for 18 to 50 year old able-bodied adults without uh, thorough participation in the work programs and education training activities. Um, elderly is considered 60 years or older. And if you're disabled, you must meet one of these following criteria. You receive federal disability or blindness programs under the Social Security Act, including Supplemental Security Income, which is known as SSI, or Social, Social Security Disability or Blindness Payments. You receive state disability or blindness payments based on, based on SSI rules. You receive a disability retirement benefit from a, pro, from a governmental agency because of a permanent disability. You have an annuity under the Railroad Retirement Act and are el eligible for Medicare or considered disabled under SSI. A veteran who is totally disabled, permanently homebound, or in need of regular attendance, or you are the surviving spouse or child of a veteran who is receiving VA benefits. The SNAP work requirements are home harmful because anti-hunger advocates say that the current time limit is one of the harshest rules under the current SNAP operation, and thus this proposal will make it worse. They say the rule will punish people by taking away food at a time when they need it the most, even if they're willing to work or work more hours but are simply unable to do so. This will impact a server or hourly employee who gets um, to the end of the month only to have their shift cut, leaving them under the required hours. This change would hurt those who are already on very shaky ground and struggling with food insecurity. This proposed rule could really impact low wage workers who already don't have reliable hours and limited benefits. If this rule is enacted and a worker cannot meet the 20 hour a week requirement, they will be kicked off SNAP and they'll need to make decisions for how they'll make ends meet. 
the fallout will also put a big strain on organizations that serve people who rely on SNAP for every meal that and for every meal that Second Harvest Food Banks puts into the community. SNAP puts out 12. Thank you. That's huge. Thank you so much. Great job. Woo! We talk about Medicaid work requirements a lot. I don't think we had as much of a conversation about SNAP work requirements. And Roxy just did an amazing job, right? Squeezing all of that information into two pages. Fantastic. Really well done. Thank you. Um, do you so you have you still have three minutes left if you want to use it i was wondering can you talk about um what inspired you to take this project on why you chose this issue um because i understand that it's a big issue for, like it's like i said people living in low-income communities people in marginalized communities um some people you know like i stated they're like waitresses or you know, bartenders or something like that that don't get reliable hours. And if they can't meet the requirements, then Medicaid, I mean, the SNAP program will completely cut them off. So then that leaves them in a position where do I pay my rent or do I feed my baby? And I don't think that that's a decision that anybody living in America needs to make. Yeah. Thank you so much. Fantastic job. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, from here, we now move on to Meta. Are you on? Yeah, can you hear me? Perfect, we can hear you, take it over. Let's hear what your practicum is. Okay, my practicum was a policy brief and I entitled it, I Deserve Protection, The Time Is Now. Next slide. And what I talked about was a Louisiana statute that provides that employers with more than 20 employees within the United States shall not discriminate against employees for reasons based on age, race, sex, religion, or national origin. Keep that in mind. Next slide. All right, what I did. I did a focus group that hosted 10 black trans women to interview them on their lived experiences of employment discrimination and experiences of being treated unfairly based on sexual orientation or gender identity. There were 10 women present and what they shared only fortified the feelings that I had about the need for employment protections for black trans women. Listening to these women describe their experiences experiences and what it's like to work as a trans woman in Louisiana, to say the least, was not only angering and frustrating, it was heartbreaking over trying to be yourself, to have these, to listen at these women's stories and to listen to what they had to go through, just to be able to provide for themselves and their families. Next slide. So, this is what I heard. One of the women said that I wake up in fear and I go to sleep in fear. Each time I leave my home, I am bombarded with thoughts of being assaulted if I'm lucky and if not killed while trying to provide for myself and to keep a roof over my head. Another woman stated that many black women choose sex work and drug work, not because when people, when they're out there, the folks are picking them up, they know who they are and what they're doing and why they're out there, and that's why they stop. It was about doing this kind of work, really, they didn't feel so judged. Knew what was it was about, they told me that it was about supply and demand, and by far, it was not their first choice. It was horrifying that because of what they faced at work, they chose sex work or drug work just to keep a roof over their heads. Next slide. All right, what can we do? To begin with, what we did, well, we looked at some cities in Louisiana that have protections for all. And while as a state, Louisiana certainly needs protections for employment rights for trans women of color, there should be no debate, 
no debate as to, as to whether we need it, but when. We do know that in New Orleans, they banned all gender identity discrimination. And we can start as a state by implementing across the board. Louisiana has seen blows to change many things, even in the face of its citizens, accepting not only trans individuals, but equal employment protection for all its citizens. A point we see legislation that amended the Fair Employment and Housing Act to expressly prohibit workplace discrimination and harassment based on gender identity and gender expression. Surely, we can all see the benefit of that legislation and the impact that it would have on the Black trans women of Louisiana. Next slide. Black trans women of Louisiana face obstacles, stigma, and discrimination just for being who they are. How can we as a people set up, this is supposed to read, set up for anything less than enacting and enabling our women to live fearlessly with equal rights and justice for all women in Louisiana, but particularly for our Black trans women who have suffered way too long without protection. Let's be change Louisiana. Let's be the great state that we are and tell its Black trans women that we will no longer settle for the status quo, that we will fight to ensure that providing for their basic needs does not come with harassment, violence, discrimination, stigma, or fear, that their lives matter, and that their voices matter, and that their safety matters. Next slide. In closing, let's work together lawmakers and advocates to create protections for all its citizens. I would like to leave you with this. For society to thrive, it must include protections for all its members. And without fail, ensuring that there are measures in place that keep Black women of trans experience empowered and assured that they can and will be protected. Next slide. Bang. Boom shakalaka. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Thank y'all. That's my president. Yes. Thank y'all very much. Yes. Very Mega. Much. <laughs> it Excellent. was challenging to say the least. <laughs> that was amazing. You know what it, it sounds like to me? It sounds like that um, the listening session you did can be the start of like coalition work, right? Like making sure that you're building these protections with the voices and experience of black women of trans. Right, experience. and recently we just added a trans employee and she was part of the focus group. Good, yeah, yeah, that was great. So you said that it was challenging. What were some of the challenges that you faced? Um, actually being able to to get trans women to trust women. Mm. That's the challenge. Because we don't like this women, we don't understand, we get it, we don't go around. And I assure them that PWN Louisiana, we not like the rest of the bras in the state. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we wanted them to know that not only do we want to include them, but that we will back them. Whatever they are doing or want to do, that they have the support of PWN Louisiana. Mm -hmm. That was a challenge. And then the fact that I became a caretaker halfway through the stretch did not help in the least. In the least. Yeah. Yeah. And you see like the Trump administration who's taking all of these actions to try and invisibilize, invisibilize people of trans experience. So it's more important than ever to really make sure that we're yes. centering folks who are experiencing discrimination and all of our advocacy, which you did. Great exactly. job. Adam. And we're going to keep fighting. Thank you. Great job. Okay. I am going to have to shuffle the order a little bit. Marnina, you're supposed to go next, but I'm going to actually have Nishi go next because she's got to go do other things. Okay. So we're going to skip down and pull up Nishi's presentation. Are you there and able to talk? Yes, I am here. Good evening, everybody. Hello. 
Hey, girl. Tell her, tell your daughter hello too. She's sitting right here. She's gonna get out of the car. She has to start her pre-session for the pageant. So hey, girl. Keep up. <laughs> Thank you. Alrighty, so everybody know who I am. I'm Nishi Parkinson from St. Louis, Missouri. My host organization was Empower Missouri. Um, and I will go ahead and start next slide. So several of us had a different tasks, but our description for my project was a meaningful environment for persons living with HIV, um, which, you know, MIPA is a care tenant in HIV advocacy, acknowledging the policies impacted for people living with HIV, um, and to also be crafty with putting out information and gaining participants. So that was my role and description for this project. Uh, while working with um, Empowerment uh, Missouri, I was able to attend several events in St. Louis and Jefferson City and Columbia. The first event was with uh, Senator Tracy McCrary. She's working on our bill to um, change the language for HIV uh, decriminalization laws here in Missouri. So we were able to work um, alongside her, her and Senator uh, Rep uh, Rader to create a um, fact sheet about two bills that would modernize Missouri HIV laws. Um, we provided feedback and testimonial statements during our lobby day in Jefferson City. And we're also headed up another lobby day on Tuesday, which is tomorrow in Jefferson City tomorrow. Um, I attended all virtual conferences and calls, um, in-person meetings. Um, I am also pending one in-person meeting with our city aldermen to talk about my testimony and the story um, behind my um, personal experience with living with HIV. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to have that opportunity to share with her. Next slide. Okay, you guys, I can barely see that, so I'm going to flip my paper copy so that I can read along. Um, the steering committee that I was involved in was the education and membership uh, with Evania. She was nominated to be our lead uh, person, and I agreed to be part of her staffing um, just to kind of educate the community, build the membership, and basically build that space for persons living with HIV. Also, we had an opportunity to have legislator Susan Gibson accepted a role um, being a lead stakeholder for us, and that was staffed by uh, Breanne. Um, our advocacy and media person, Diane Buckhold, she accepted the lead position also to work with Molly Pearson uh, with Empower Missouri. She's also an intern, and she's very, she's phenomenal. I love working with her. Um, our advocacy day considered um, St. Louis, Columbia, Jefferson City, and Kansas City, Missouri. So we had all in individuals from all different uh, cities and categories just basically break down a list and go meet with all of the representatives and talk about HIV criminalization laws and what our views and how we felt about the laws and the language and the verbiage. Our first coalition, uh, coalition advocacy meeting was back on uh, Tuesday, February the 2nd. Uh, we had roughly about 12 of us and we broke up into different small groups. Uh, Ms. Janice Evans, she retired from the Minority Health um, system here in St. Louis, which is in Jefferson City, and she accompanied us on that advocacy day. So I was able to partner with her and JMO um, to talk with um, our legislators. Um, update on our registration numbers. I don't have the registration numbers quite handy uh, to find out who all has been registered and who's part of our team. Uh, but the people that I've already listed before are still actively working with our team. Uh, we also had meetings where we set up um, with our members of the health and mental health committees. We conducted voicemails, we left messages, uh, we scheduled times to meet with them, and Molly is also working with the team to schedule more visits uh, outside of the visits that we already have scheduled. Next slide. So the two bills that we're working on for Missouri is the HB 166. And there's a link there, so if you want to go back to the slides, you can actually go and do a bill tracker on what the actual
actual uh, bill is doing. And that is under Representative uh, Tracy McCrary, and she's a Democrat out of Olivet here in St. Louis, Missouri. And Representative Rader is a Republican. He lives out of Sykes, Missouri, and he's overseeing the HB 167. Both of these bills were heard back on March, uh, on Monday, February the 4th. And next slide. Each bill um, that we have looked at, HB 166 and HB 167, Tracy McCrary uh, pre-filed the bill to reform Missouri HIV Pacific criminal, criminal laws and held a press conference to announce their support for reform that will serve Missourians living with HIV. The press conference was covered widely by the media in Missouri and the Missourians in article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Also, a letter to the editors by the members of the House um, Missouri HIV Justice Coalition. Uh, if you, any of you all know Devin Hershey, Latricia Miles, uh, they actually had an opportunity to visit uh, to actually talk about um, this HB 166 and HB 167 um, early February, March. So they did a great job, and we had one gentleman. Uh, actually write his testimony and uh, attach it to an email uh, that I was told that I could not share in this presentation today, but it was a heart-wrenching um, testimony. Uh, the bill HB 167, uh, Representative Rader, and HB 166, Representative McCrary, are similar bills filed last year when the coalition was uh, integral, a part of the drafting. So between 2008 and 2019, the two se sessions that they had had various stakeholders have expressed the support for changing the law and changing the language. Uh, the Missouri HIV Justice Coalition has endorsed these bills and will continue to monitor them and prepare for any potential committee's hearing during the upcoming 2019 legislative se session. Next slide. So this Advocacy Day um, happened, and I believe advocacy makes the world go around. So the one that I mentioned about Devin and Latricia um, actually meeting up in Jefferson City, the Missouri HIV Justice Coalition, um, you can see in the slide the phenomenal people that are in the picture. And then to the left of that, you see Janice and I also. Um, with that being said, all of the... Um, all of the things that we've done for um, HIV is not a crime with all of the representatives that we have um, on deck for us. I think that we made a significant amount of headway. I think they hear our um, gripes. I think they hear our testimonies. I think they hear the real-time moments to really make a change uh, for Missouri um, as a whole, but we're not there yet. And this, this chapter for its policy for me like Jesse said, it's not an end. Uh, it's a continuance um, to kind of let our voices continue to be heard, uh, continue to be moving through our communities, to build memberships, to build education, um, to continue to build platforms and capacities around this, you know, heart-wrenching topic that some people are just not educated about. And as we are in this moment, uh, JMO is actually sending me new updated information on HB 166, so I cannot wait to hear and read the information of the next step. I want to say congratulations to everyone on this platform today. Sisters, we still moving. We're ambassadors for policy, and congratulations to each and every one of you guys. I don't want to cry, but... This has been a phenomenal journey, um, and I've had a lot of hiccups in the road, and some of us have had a lot of hiccups in the road, but I want to just say stay strong, keep moving, self-care is the best care, and we are winning at this point. We want to thank PWN for all of the hard work that they have put in us. I want to thank our coaches. Uh, wish us well. Cry Purple will be uh, at the SYNC 2019 conference next week, and we have a big 90-minute workshop that we will be integrating and changing lives for the best. All righty. All right. Congratulations, Mishi. Great job. And don't make me cry. Don't make me cry. Please don't make me cry. I 
wish you could stay on for us. We actually do. So are you going to be able to jump back on, do you think? I'm going to try. Uh, they won't let her start a session without me being in the building. So let me run in and I'll okay. try to jump back on. I'll leave you guys on mute, okay? Okay. We love you and appreciate right. you. Great job. All right. Bye for now. Bye. All right, that was excellent. So now we are going to jump back in time a little bit and turn to Marnie, who did just one of the most stunningly beautiful fact sheets I think I've ever seen, but I'm going to let her take it over from here. Oh, uh, you're so sweet. I wasn't able to make a, um, like you guys have all made PowerPoints, I wasn't able to make one because I'm out here at work, but I hope we can make it a little bigger so that they can see it. I don't know if you can. So yes, I'm guys, I made a policy fact sheet for decision makers and um, educators, just people that work with youth. Um, I wanted to make this policy fact sheet just because I think that lawmakers, parents, uh, student government organizations, as far as like the kids who run for student government in their classes, teachers, and I also found out that the that each school has a school health advisory council. So it's basically a council made up of teachers, of professionals, and even of community members that are in the community that makes entire decisions for the entire school district. So these student health advisory councils make the decisions whether they will teach um, abstinence only education or whether they will talk about comprehensive sex education in schools. Currently, Texas has on the books where they do not have to talk about comprehensive sex education. In fact, in Texas, you have to talk about abstinence only. And when you talk about abstinence only, you know, that's only talking about, oh, you can't have sex and just say no. And those, that type of rhetoric of where you should be married before you have sex and things like that. So you guys know that like you, since I am considered, at least for the next year, <laughs> considered a youth. Um, youth are really, really important. And um, they're really close to my heart. And so I definitely want to talk about like the basic human rights of comprehensive sex education, because a lot of the times when I hear Wahida talk, she, she always talks about structural violence. So I did a little digging and um, structural violence means things that may harm people by pre preventing them from meeting their basic needs. Like, you know, a lot of people time when they talk about structural violence, they talk about mass incarceration. But one of the things that's really, really beneficial, especially for like reproductive justice, reproductive health, for youth is comprehensive sex education. A lot of times you get their information from kids at school or from teachers or from like their peers or their friends, but it would be amazing if youth in Texas would be able to have that information and that fact-based information from healthcare professionals, from people that work not only in the community, but also teachers that are trained and not just, um, trained to talk about just sex, but also talking about LGBT inclusion and stuff. So um, I did a little bit of digging and I thought that between 15 to 24 year olds account for half of all new STIs and STD contractions, which is about 10 million new diagnoses, health diagnoses, which is crazy. It can cause infertility, low birth rate, unwanted pregnancies and STDs and STIs. And I think comprehensive sex education could be so useful because not only will we talk about sex, but they should be discussing rape culture, which is the whole idea of a boy could just have sex with whoever he wants to know. We need to talk about no means no, even if a girl is inebriated. If she can't make the decision to tell you that she wants to have sex, you cannot have sex with her. And that's what comprehensive sex education includes. It includes all of those topics, including talking about inappropriate touch. I think even we need to talk to elementary school kids as young as five and six years old. That's a lot of molestation in, in homes and even in the schools, in schools, talking about comprehensive sex education. Um, no one should be touching your private parts. And a lot of times parents don't have those conversations with those kids. And I think a lot of times that we can have those discussions in comprehensive sex education. Um, and then talking about like, the basic human rights, 44 to 47% of teenagers are having sex, which is like 50%, y'all, 50% of kids who are in high school are having sex. So why keep that information from them? And then I have on here that we all should be, should be talking about LGBTQ inclusion and talking about gender identity. 
Uh, I didn't, to be honest, I never knew what trans meant until I became an adult. That is crazy. Until I graduated from high school and went to a gay club, that's the first time I ever thought about gender identity, which is sad because I graduated in 07. And in 2007, I did not know anything about the trans community. I did not know any, any of the language of LGBTQ because there was no one to teach me and to have these difficult conversations. And a lot of the times kids get bullied because they don't have that information to say, oh, that person is, and they don't have the knowledge or the uh, vocabulary to be able to express what they are themselves. If they are LGBTQ, they don't even have the information to talk about um, dushing, proper dushing, or whether they should be dushing if they're having anal sex. So I think that's extremely important. And it also reduce health disparities in communities of color. We know that um, HIV impacts black and brown communities at high rates. But if we start talking to kids younger and younger about comprehensive sex education, about condoms and stuff, it would be more beneficial. I also um, have on here that teaching no doesn't, doesn't help those who will just say yes. Sometimes kids are going to say yes to sex. And we need to prepare them to have those healthy conversations with each other. And just because you have on a raincoat doesn't mean it is not going to rain. Like a lot of times we think that, oh, we'll just give them condoms. But what about herpes, which you can contract with a, with a condom? What about HPV? And the more youth know, the more they can protect themselves. And another thing in comprehensive sex education we should be talking about is teaching self-esteem building because there's a link um, I did, I looked at some studies and there's a link between self-esteem and condom usage. The more you love yourself, the more you are able to have self-efficacy, the more you're able to love who you are, the more you will make someone use a condom, the more you will respect yourself and respect your body and make somebody else respect it. Um, and then we should talk about age-appropriate age information for all of them and um, the tools needed to make healthy decisions whether that's PrEP, whether that's PEP, um, just given those, given those conversations in which you could be able to discuss those things. And then we have to include cultural competency. Uh, a lot of times when we talk to youth, we don't talk, talk, we talk at them, but not using the language in which they use. So definitely having someone who has more of the verbiage in which they do talk, making it fun, making it interactive. And, um, in Texas, Texas specifically, we have H, the House Bill 1547, which was introduced by State Rep. Mary Gonzalez back in 2017. Now, it did die in the House, but she was talking about comprehensive sex education, and she was trying to get it passed. And we all know Texas is a red state, so they shot it down very quickly. But what I did notice in her bill, it did not even talk about LGBTQ inclusion. It did not talk about gender identity. It only talked about adding in STDs and STIs inside of comprehensive sex education. So we have so much work here to do in Texas. 81,000 people in Texas are living with HIV. So we need to make sure that we are making people aware and building up their awareness. And that is all I have, guys. Yes, great job. Uh, this is just a fantastic resource. Like really, really congratulations. Um, do you know sort of what you want to do next? So I definitely want to see if I could get somebody that is currently um, a state representative to maybe champion that type of bill for me. And mm -hmm. maybe I can get my PWN sisters down here so we can rally up one of our champions here in the Senate or in the House to maybe do something about this because I think this is extremely important and something that Texas definitely needs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guess what, Marnina? Thanks, thanks. Hey, sweetie pie. Well, I'm working on a bill to bring back sex education in primary and secondary school, which is House Bill 2161. Really? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we need to get together. Yes, ma'am. Is this collaboration happening in real time? That's amazing. So <laughs> when we get off the call, we will talk. That's awesome. Okay, girl. All right, baby. All right. <laughs>
I'm going to rule the world. That's amazing. Good job. That is how Texas All rocks. Right. Job, yeah. All right. And next up, we turn to Olga, who just tackled an enormous topic in her policy brief. It was very, very difficult to get it into sort of a manageable format. And she did an amazing job. I'm going to let Olga take it over from here. Hello. I just didn't have time to do a uh, PowerPoint because uh, a lot of things happened on the way. But uh, Jenny's got basically. Oh, my God. Sorry about that, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly did a pretty good thing right there. That's my title that I did. Uh, I decided to do, uh, I decided to work on Medicaid and the work requirements because Ohio at the time when I started this was talking about um, having work requirements uh, to, uh, to keep on Medicaid and to receive Medicaid. And I was very, very concerned about it. Not so much for me. But I was more concerned about it about for my husband because he is just able to get on to Medicaid. Um, so I was what worried about basically too how it and not as somewhat and a lot of how it's gonna affect me too with pre existing condition and plus with all the protesting I was doing this year, I kinda understood some of it, but I didn't understand like all the fine little prints and stuff like this. And I'm like, if I get asked questions, I better know what I'm talking about. And so just say, I'm following the group. So that's why I chose Medicaid. And I really did not want to do a brief at the beginning because of dyslexia and I have a little bit, and I try to take it an easy way out for me, which is like, doing a fact sheet or a needs assessment or something like that where I could gather data and then, you know, use somebody else's stuff and then put it in order. So I thought that was going to be easier. And once I started looking into this, I'm like, oh, no, that was not going to be easier. But this was very challenging for me to, for writing on um, skill. Um, so I'm going through, I know I'm doing this backwards. No, you're doing but, great. You're doing great. Um, but I'm so excited about getting that stuff across, but going into actually what I've done. So what I've done on my paper, I went into um, on Medicaid, what it started and what um, and what it was supposed to be for. First, for the low, uh, people who are uh, low income Americans to have health with the uh, um, insurance program. Especially if they were working and they, you know, was underpaid, and it also helped them if they had children or women who were pregnant, uh, senior citizens, with just uh, people with disabilities, and anybody with any medical condition to help them get extra care, you know, get the care that they all need, you know, stay healthy, and. Medicaid it was originally is it still is funded by federal and state government, and it's through waivers that this goes through, and the waivers um, are written a little bit different, but basically the same for each uh, for each federal and state. But with state, they can, they have to go by what federal is but they make their own decision on like how to budget it. But they have to re uh, make sure they cover everything federal, uh, the federal say they cover. And they make their own decision. Um, so, um, so what maybe do this, this too, and this is a uh, work requirements with Medicaid. To me, it just is not a good idea at all because it's going to, it, just, just right now, with the way, even without requirements for work requirements, reporting and all the stuff you got to go through, filing papers and stuff every every year somewhere to make sure you meet the med, uh, benefit requirements, the economy, you know, your income, your living situations, and all that, all your medical records. You got to, you know, right now without the work requirements, you always got to file forms and. 
go through assessments and everything. And right now it's complicated, you know, just it's hard on uh, on everybody, even the workers to keep track, you know, they're, they're stressed out and overworked with the client load. Um, and understanding what and the client's doing every time when they're supposed to be fly. And now it's more of a burden on all of them, on everybody, but because now they got to record once a month instead of once a year. And they got to prove they're working or like doing something to try to get jobs. And it's just crazy. And nobody set up really for the uh, able to do the data, you know, to keep up with the data, track of the data, how to send out, you know, the papers and stuff to the client. It's time to do your assessment and everything because you're just getting out one paper, you know, what it, it's just too complicated. No, and, none of the, and three, a few other states have tried it and they failed. Arkansas tried it, and and the main reason why they failed was because they had they had a very bad system and a hard time trying to figure out how to track. In fact, um, Five percent of the Arkansas Ar Ar uh, people living in Arkansas were subject to work requirements, and in twelve hundred out of that uh, twelve thousand, well, I can't. About twelve thousand people were cut off of their uh, benefits, not because they weren't working; they were working. But they didn't know all the requirements that they needed to do to keep their benefit and to keep track of when they got a report and all that. And then they didn't know that they, you know, that you know you're only el eligible for, uh, you know, you're cut off, you're ineligible for three months, then you can reapply. They didn't even know that they had, they thought they had to wait a whole other year to reapply. Which means they thought they have to wait for the year, a year from when they had been cut off. Like if they were cut off in June, they think they're they're cut off to this June coming this year. Which in reality, in January, they could have reapplied. Were in September, they could have reapplied, but they were never aware of this, and some of the caseworkers weren't even aware of this. The workers. And in another state that it hasn't worked in was um, Kentucky, which is very close to my state. Um, basically, they got ruled out from well, it went to some hearings and stuff, and just recently this month got denied the final time, so it won't go through. It's basically because the same judge that heard Arkansas stuff and was researching, he basically said it was unconstitutional, unhumanly for this to be, you know, and he ruled the same way he ruled in Arkansas as for Kentucky. In my paper, I have his name and I have this all down, exactly stats and everything. Poor, poor Kelly, she was my coach. She ended up her first set of pages. I think I gave you what thirty pages with nothing but data. <laughs> it was data a lot. Start. There was a lot of research in there. Yeah, <laughs> and try to break it down to six pages. We're like, oh no, <laughs> we're panicking. <laughs> and then um, we just this month, beginning of this month. When I thought my paper was all done, I had it done. I'm like, oh no, Ohio just made the decision for work requirements, but they still have to go through the two other, like, two other, like, um, hearings to, um, to see if it goes through. So, but hopefully we've learned our lesson from Arkansas and uh, Kansas uh, and Kentucky. That this isn't really this is not good at all. People are losing their Medicaid, getting sicker and sicker. Um, the kids are going with uh, the kids are getting sicker too. 
Um, you're making the kids suffer. Olga, will you be able to go to any of the public hearings, do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm planning on it. Uh, uh, I missed two because they were in Columbus. Mm -hmm. One was actually in Cincinnati, and that was like a six-hour drive. And what held me back from going to that one was having a place to stay overnight. Sure. And the one in Columbus is they're like three. That's three hours from me. And it's kind of hard for me to travel like that, you know, especially when I was there like a week before for, you know, one of white, white meetings. So if they're like, I'm planning on doing them when they come more local, like the little town, town, you know, the little regional meetings. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely going to be there. That's You're going to check me up on that. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, um, and like I said, this gave me more self-esteem that I could actually put something in intelligible terms in writing mm -hmm. instead of just going off top of my head mm -hmm. on things. Thank you for going through all. I mean, I had you going all over the place, but this stat was for this. Oh, wait, this is relevant. I don't know how you went through those notes. <laughs> You did great. Congratulations to you for finishing. And I'm up. ready to write more stuff. You know, I was, I was, you know, I don't know if I'm going to have time yet. I doubt if I'm going to have time. I was what I wanted to do that for the staff's benefits. Congratulations. A big round of applause to Olga for finishing up that practicum. Very good. Okay. And we are ending with a just a bombshell of a practicum now up is Shelia to tell us about hiv care and disclosure while incarcerated with this amazing powerpoint hello everybody can y'all hear me hey girl we hear you gotcha oh because i can barely hear y'all hey <laughs> hey well, as you can see, I'm doing my practicum on HIV healthcare and disclosure while incarcerated. Next slide, please. Um, the, the table of contents will be as follows. Description of the state laws on HIV criminalization, HIV criminalization stats, graphics on the maps, interview with people who was living with HIV while they was incarcerated, and research upon, upon their release and bridging the gap Linkage to care. Next slide, please. Okay, the facts of HIV laws in the United States. Uh, next slide. Okay, the dark purple, the bur burgundy, show there are 34 states with HIV Pacific laws. The light reddish states are the states with general felony laws. And the gray states are the states with uh, communicable disease laws. But in Texas, we have no laws. Our laws is like general felony. We use our body as a weapon. So we are working on that though. Next slide, please. Okay. I interviewed a 50 year old black trans woman, which is Jamie Collins, who was incarcerated in 2017. And there were several questions that I asked her because I was just nosy. Um, I asked her when she got ready to be placed, how did they place her? And they, they asked her, what, did she want to be on the homosexual dorm, the HIV dorm, or in general population? She said that she did not want to be on the homosexual dorm because she didn't want to be around all them sissies. She said she didn't want to be on the HIV dorm because she didn't want to be uh, stigmatized. So she chose general population. Whew. And while she was in there, everybody was treated, she was treated fairly. And when she went to go get her meds or went to her appointments, did nobody know what she was going to the doctor for. So it was good for her. Next slide, please. Okay, the next one is on Carrie. She went to prison in 1998 for the first time. And while she was there, she was in Gatesville, Texas, 
on Mount View Unit for women. She was placed in a dorm with women living with HIV and AIDS that was pregnant, mostly young girls. They was, there were no disclosure at all for the women. And when they would get called for their meds, they would say, move aside, everyone. Here come the HIV people. So she said that it was a lot of stigma toward them, and it was a lot of young girls who wanted to kill themselves because of that fact, because they didn't have no privacy whatsoever, and people were picking at them. And even though I didn't realize that the HIPAA law and the guidelines were not enforced during that time. Okay, and if we were, H if we, we were women living with HIV and AIDS, you would be only liable to work in the medical folder department to where that's the only thing they could trust you with because they didn't, wasn't educated on HIV and AIDS. Next slide, please. Okay, Carrie went back to prison in 1999, and there she went to uh, Grapevine, Texas, which was in Dickerson, Texas, on Texas City Unit. In, and in there, she was in a hospital unit where she was placed where there was no dome assigned to them because the fact it was behind the building where everybody that was, had any kind of medical condition was stationed at. They was housed in this particular dorm. So when they went to see that doctor, did nobody know what was going on. They just went to the doctor, got their meds, and went on about their business. And on this unit, they, did have, they didn't have to worry about being disclosed. But the one thing that did trouble her was that everybody on the unit that was getting medication, they were getting AZT, 3CT, and D4 T. And many of the drugs that they were given was harmful and wasn't helpful. And most of them was dying from cancer or from the drugs. Okay, next slide. Skip that slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, now, transition from correctional to community-based HIV care. After doing detailed research with the WWNCBI dot NIM dot NIH government, I learned that weeks immediately following release from prison, a particular vulnerable period for most former inmates. It increased causes, mortality, high rates of drug overdose, as well increase in HIV transmission risk behavior has been demonstrated during this period. Getting back into care is very low fallen relief. As most inmates, lack health insurance and ties to regular source to care. I think this is where they need a gatekeeper to once they are released from prison, that they have somewhere there or before they leave prison to be there for them, to get them linkage into care to where there would be no barriers for them, to where be no more new transmission. Next slide, please. So, I have came up with a project that I'm going to be doing called Bridging the Gap, which I will be approaching a couple facilities and teaching them classes on HIV 101, which I learned for PWN, to where I can get most of the re-entry people living with HIV into care as soon as possible. And I've already set up a point with two parole officers and with a free well bound program here that's in Texas which I will be also opening up my own nonprofit called Hugs, which means helping us gain success. And that is the end of my presentation. Woo! Your own nonprofit? Yay, yes. Celia. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. What, what inspired you to take this project on? Well, when I was in prison, well, I can't say I went to prison. I was at a, I was at Club Med, and I noticed how a lot of people were being treated who were sick, but I didn't know what was going on because I wasn't diagnosed at the, at the moment. Mm. But I, I decided that, you know, being in prison, being incarcerated is a thing for me. Because I have family members, uh, cousins, and all that that's been incarcerated, but that 
I just wanted to see how it was for them, for the ladies that I did interview, how their life was while they was in prison and being positive. Mm -hmm. How were they treated? And I seen that it wasn't nice for nobody. So I was already working on a nonprofit, but it didn't have nothing to do with being incarcerated, with being doing, dealing with young women having HIV. Okay. So that's why I thought about it and I collaborated with someone else here when I was talking about how I was trying to bridge the gap in between the two because that's how most of them get out of care because once they get home, they don't have that medication. They don't have that resource. They don't know where they can go to get what they need. Yeah. So they fall back into the system. So I'm trying to stop that revolving door. Yeah. Such an important message. Really well done. Thank you for the PowerPoint. Thank you. Great wow, job. That was great. But you know, um, far as here in Michigan, we actually have a program called the reentry program where they actually give funding for those that are incarcerated to keep them linked up into care. So maybe that's something you might want to look into. Okay, thank you, Capricornian. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. But see, they have a lot of programs like that here, but in the way I've seen it, it they only in it for the money. They not in it for the individual. Mm -hmm. I'm in it for the individual, not the money. Word of love. Who did that? So. Yeah. I reached out to some folks because like, first off, like, I love you all. You've done such an amazing job. I wasn't there in the beginning. I was just here to see you through in the end. And even from the short time that I've been around you and been able to facilitate this fellowship, it's just been amazing to watch you all grow and deepen your advocacy, grow in your racial and gender justice analysis. Um, and so these are just some words of love coming from some folks who emailed me when they found out that you all were graduating. Congratulations, ladies. So very proud of each of you and every one of you, each and every one of you from Angela. Congratulations, 2019 Policy Fellow graduates, specifically calling out Jesse Mona, Marnina, Roxy, Shelia, and Tana. We're Texas proud from your PWN Texas sisters. I, I don't know if Nishi had to jump off. I was hoping that she'd get to see this one, but congratulations on this accomplishment, Nishi. Welcome to the Policy Fellow family. And I, I can add to that, welcome every single one of you to the Policy Fellow family. Congratulations. Congratulations, Policy Fellows. I eavesdrop on Kelly talking to you all on the phone and webinars, and it's such a joy to hear how you're engaging with the material and bringing it back home. I am so proud of you all from Anand. And like, yes, yes, this fellowship, this practicum teach back really shows how much everyone's bringing it back home and like starting up on projects. It's like, I, I believe it was Jesse Mona who said it, but this is the beginning of so much more. Um, amazing job, everyone. Congratulations to all of our graduates. You are so precious. That one's a shout out from Wahida. Congratulations, fellows. I hope each of you are extremely proud of yourselves and your commitment. I recall at times not knowing how to continue with everything happening in America, but I learned firsthand how government works and experienced several things in real, times, in real time. I hope you did too. Congratulations again from Tiami. Congratulations, Policy Fellowship graduates. You are all rock stars, or rather something bigger and better than rock stars. You are Shiro's. Looking forward to seeing your new skills in action over the coming weeks, months, and years. In sisterhood and solidarity, Jenny. Congrats to the powerful women of Policy Fellowship. I'm so proud of each of you for sticking in there for the year to build your skills and policy issues that matter to women living with HIV from Teresa. I mean, they just keep going. Like I was getting, my inbox was flooded with these. <laughs> Congratulations, sisters. I am very proud of all of you for your dedication to the, year of policy, to the year of policy fellowship. It takes commitment and dedication and you all conquered the year. Congratulations. With love from Brandy.
again, thank you, the 2018 to 19 Positive Women's Network USA Policy Fellowship for completing the PWN USA Policy Fellowship. Because of you all, we are stronger and closer to living long, healthy, dignified, and productive lives free from stigma and discrimination. From Chiron. So that is everything I have for you. I literally have nothing else to give or teach you. You have it all and you have the tools and you're going to go forward and remake the world. Congratulations to all of the policy fellows, now policy fellow graduates. I hope you update your email signatures. And one more round of applause for everyone. Clap for yourself, clap for your sisters. Yay! 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 <laughs> great job. I'll be reaching out. You'll hear from me again. You'll hear from me again for all sorts of reasons. I'll probably ask you to be on some webinars for the next year's cohort. Um, but I Advocacy 101 already! <laughs> <laughs> yes! Um, but I'm also going to email you, make sure I have your uh, mailing addresses right so I can get you all your certificates to show that you are official PWN graduates. Well done, everyone. Ooh. We hey. don't get no cake no wine! <laughs> if you have to go home, you should have a glass now. It's a long time. It's for the water. I have water. I have water. I got my water. I have a wheel drink on Saturday. All right. I'll see oh, you next week. I'll see you next week. I'll see you next week. Yeah, me, me, she, and, and, and Shelia are presenting in D.C. this weekend, so we're going like to celebrate a, there. A mini fellowship reunion. <laughs> That's awesome. No, it's yeah, we're good luck, y'all. All right, everyone. Fantastic job. I'm going to stop recording. Thank you. Love y'all. See you. Bye, guys.